Edward, a very warm welcome to you all. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Stuart Lang. I'm the chairman of the anglo Romani Society. Uh, and it's a great privilege for the Society to be able to welcome Safa uh, to actually our first uh, event in this uh, building since March 2020, when the restrictions, the COVID restrictions began. So what better way to open up uh, than with a lecture like this um, and to, to welcome the SAFA members and also society members uh, to this building. I'm going to hand over now to David, our general manager, who's going to do some housekeeping points, and then Mike Lobb will introduce our speaker. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I may add my... Sorry, applause is all the <laughs> <laughs> Never want to cut the chairman off applause, but... Uh, if I could just add my welcome to all, as SAFA and the AOS, we've, uh, you know, amalgamated, we're trying to uh, get back to some normality, and if you like, in Amman terms, this is a soft opening, I think they like to call it. So, um, yes, I'm David Newton, I'm the general manager, we've got the normal team, there's Dean, is Dina here, or is she down doing, and then we, I just want to introduce, we've got James Marriott, one of our interns on the camera, and we've got Lydia. Jax, who's just joined us, our next six month intern. So they've got great stories to tell, um, yeah. much better than me. So please tackle them afterwards if you, if you get a moment. Um, I don't want to go too long, but I do have, because it's a SAFA, I just thought I would tell one little story because I'm really delighted to be the general manager and I didn't realize why until I did my Amazon order and I put the general manager, and I'm delighted when the package comes, it goes, the general, anglo Romani <laughs> Society. <laughs> so I'm delighted to be the general in the, in the anglo Romani Society, and, uh, and, and, and that's good. So we're going to try and get back to some normality, just to do the um, uh, advertisement. Um, how quiet that will be, we'll do as many events as we can, but there will be a few more online. Um, but we'll obviously try and keep you advised uh, and updated as best we can. Um, I do have to say, the toilets, etc., are out that way. The two fire escapes are either through the kitchen or straight through out into the foyer. Don't please go through this way, because you just go down into a courtyard. Um, and obviously, if anyone wants to get back in touch with me afterwards, or Dina, um, all the two interns, then please do feel free. Um, Mike, I think over to you. It's SAFA events after all, and uh, we look forward to it. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I had um, quite a, a, an amount of research on our speaker this evening, but I don't need to repeat it because you'll find it all here on page 17 in your review. So his name's up there, David Bennett. He is uh, a cavalry officer who, for the last nine years of his service, has been up and down the Gulf, and for the last three years of his service was the uh, defence of liaison officer at Dukham, and all that entails. But you haven't come here to listen to me speak, so I'll hand over to David, and we're going to hear what he has to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. It is a great pleasure to be here, and it's also very nice to see a certain number of friendly faces in the audience, and I hope we're still friends at the end of my presentation. Um, uh, just one apology. If this is your first foray out after 18 months with COVID and you're having to listen to me, I'm really, really sorry. There are better things I'm sure you can be done as your first uh, venture outside. Um, Anyway, it's a delight to always, as always, be talking about uh, Oman and that fascinating country and the irresistible hold that it holds over us all. I hope that what I told you about the Dukham project will interest you. Uh, it is a project that's still very much alive and uh, given the pace of events in the Middle East uh, and east of Suez particularly, highly relevant. I must point out I have no particular expertise in uh, national strategy or international affairs and stand ready to be corrected by anybody in this esteemed audience. Um, any views, such as my wife allows me, to have them are my own. <laughs> the uh, phrase East of Suez, I think, is redolent with historical significance, conjuring up a time when the UK had a broad global view of its role and contribution to the world a comprehensive trading and maritime security perspective. The phrase also has particular residence, 
resonance, as it embodies the policy decision announced by the Wilson government and implemented uh, by the Defence Secretary uh, at the time, Dennis Healy, in 1968, to withdraw all troops east of Suez by 1971. And this included bases in Singapore, Malaysia and the Gulf. <coughs> For some, though, the phrase gives off the regretful air of an end of an era, an avoidable retrenchment, perhaps, or a realisation that we could not afford to be everywhere, a necessary shortening of our horizons as we focused our strategic effort on our commitment to NATO and the European theatre as, and to counter this Soviet threat. Perhaps we had no other strategic uh, choice following on from the Suez uh, crisis, <coughs> after which President Nasser of Egypt uh, nationalised the canal. That set the scene for our, for our retreat from empire, which although handled uh, very well, was also blighted by a succession of small counterinsurgency wars, such as Asian, which was vividly epitomised by our uh, operations in that country. Policies have consequences, and the withdrawal east of Suez meant a loosening of our bonds with some of our oldest and closest friends, and reducing our capacity, both diplomatically and militarily, to identify and deter threats to our security from a wider world. Now, you don't need me to spell out the many uh, dangers that are present uh, across the world at the moment. The fallout from Afghanistan, the rise of China and its expansionism, the threats from Iran, Russia, the wars in Syria and Yemen, to name but a few. But in policy terms, what we have seen over the last few years is a gradual reassertion of our traditional role, a return to our more familiar global perspective, working with a variety of allies beyond just Europe to counter threats from many quarters to keep trade flowing and uphold the rule of law. The new strategic AUKUS agreement is a tangible manifestation of this new approach to think and act east of Suez. But it's important to understand that this process of re-engagement has been going on in the Arabian Peninsula for some time. In 2013, the Royal United Services Institute published a report which stated that Britain is in the position of a strategic shift back to an east of Suez position to fill the vacuum left as the US pivoted to the Pacific. More recently, the Integrated Review of Security, Defence, Development and Foreign Policy here uh, global Britain gave that some more um, meaning. It's a concept which has still got some bones to be put, a flesh to be put on it. But a key tenet of that inter in integrated review is a renewed commitment for the UK to act as a force for good in the world. The UK's, UK's tilt to the Indo Pacific region should not uh, obscure the fact that there's increasing importance on the Middle East and its centrality to the UK's strategic interest, that it takes golf seriously and that we are prepared to take on a share of the burden of underpinning this security. A rich tapestry of engagement has served both the United Kingdom and Oman well over many years, but the real game changer in terms of our enduring relationship is the establishment of the United Kingdom's defence hub centred on the port of Dukham. The UK recognised the importance of Dukham to the Omani economy and there was a mutual identification of the opportunities that this groundbreaking enterprise afforded to meet a variety of both our defence and prosperity objectives. Now, I'm not going to uh, give you a geography lesson where it is in Oman, <laughs> because you all know where Duckham is, and I suspect in your youth uh, you have um, frequented the road from Muscat down past Three Palms Lagoon, Duckham and beyond to Salala. But you know it's about six... Uh, and a half hours or so driving from Muscat. The roads are getting faster and faster as we speak, and uh, about an hour and a quarter by, uh, by plane. But just to point out exactly where we're talking about so there's no uh, confusion. Taking you back to your uh, early days in history, in an article in your review um, by Robert Alston, uh, he states that uh, Dukham was a very small fishing village originally, on the way to the uh, Three Palms Lagoon, which uh, achieved prominence when in 1954 it was used as a beach landing location for an expedition by the Iraq Petroleum Company, uh, protected by the Oman and Muscat Field Force. From there, they travelled 200 miles across sand and gravel desert to uh, facilitate a base uh, at Fahud for the expansion uh, of the oil industry. And it's where, in Robert's words, um, the uh, allowed Oman to become a modern economy and state. 
And I think uh, that um, juxtaposition between events of 1954 and more recently are true in the sense that Dukham is very much a commercial uh, project. Um, some wonderful photographs there of uh, Dukham in the olden days with the, the port. If you imagine, there's Rasad uh, Dukham there with the, the new port taking up all this area here. Quite unbelievable, I think, for those people who were there at the time to see how that is now uh, developed. Unbelievable. My launch um, to Oman was surprising in that unusually there seemed to be a clear strategy and sense of purpose in respect of government policy. All I had to do was, um, uh, was uh, um, work out what was feasible and negotiate some of the practical implementation aspects. I had a myriad of people to see before I was allowed to step foot in the country. I didn't see uh, Sir Michael Fallon, but I worked very closely with the International Policy and Plans Branch at the MOD. Uh, Rear Admiral uh, Tony Radican was Chief of Staff of the Joint Forces Command there, and, uh, and obviously he's now First Sea Lord, but he was a good driving force behind Dukham. Uh, I'll come uh, to General Sinek Carter in a moment, but I had a, uh, a good few sessions with uh, General Sinek uh, before I was allowed to go. And there, before I went to Oman, was the Exercise Safe Surreal 3 planning conference um, in London, where Captain Saeed, I think you're there somewhere, is that you there, Sai? <laughs> there we are. Uh, uh, there. So we met uh, first time, and that was uh, very good uh, to set the scene for not only what I was going to do in Duckham particularly, but also for the, uh, for the exercise. But I had um, uh, CGSs, the Chief of General Staff's words, ringing in my ear that training, uh, such as it was, should produce outputs other than just training ourselves. And therefore the army may need to train differently and in locations where we might achieve strategic influence and a deterrence effect. And I think that his view was that our training area in Canada was excellent training, but it stopped at being excellent training. It had no other effect either on the, um, the geopolitical situation or the location we were training. And he was very much behind training summer, which had much more strategic uh, relevance. My writing instructions were clear to spearhead the establishment of a permanent joint enabling facility, as well as a land training hub in the Omar. And this would set the conditions for the future and build the plinth on which strategic presence could be based to facilitate the rising tide of engagement and military activity in the Gulf. I was very privileged uh, when I arrived in Oman to have an off both an office in the British Embassy, first of all under um, the Ambassador um, John Wilkes and subsequently under Hamish uh, Cowell, but also an office uh, in um, Mwaska al Murtafa, uh, which was extremely uh, generous of Major General Mata al Balushi, who gave me an office uh, in his training branch. And I don't underestimate the importance of this gracious granting of um, unfettered access to, to the camp. And I believe I was the first British officer to be granted such access on a permanent basis who was not on loan service. This enabled me to uh, visit the office of the Secretary General to the MOD, His Excellency Mohammed Al uh, Razmi, where I had regular dealings with his staff, including uh, Brigadier Ahmed Al Bissaidi, the militia attaché who's here tonight, who gave me a um, particular grilling uh, on where the United Kingdom statement of requirement was in order to get the Dukham project uh, going. Of course, it was slow in coming, so I made one up. <laughs> but it was good to have a very positive relationship there. And I was given access through the Secretary General's office to many other government departments, such as the Special, Special Economic Zone Authority at Duckham, the Ministry of Oil and Gas, the Ministry of Transport and Communications. And I also had uh, regular access to the corridors of the Chief of Staff of the Sultan's Armed Forces, uh, General Arnie's staff, and also General Matar's um, training staff there. The access was unparalleled and really uh, very, very productive. And I found nothing but um, excellent cooperation and a willingness to help and drive on this project at every level. And Dukham, uh, when I arrived in 2016, was very much flavour of the month. Uh, indeed, Hami Salbalushi, who was the Minister for the uh, Economic Zone at, um, at Dukham, his uh, office director, very charmingly said, the heart is open before the door. And that really set the scene for all my engagement in Oman. Wherever I went, I was expecting real challenges of uh, getting uh, this project, uh, giving it some traction. But everywhere I went, uh, I wouldn't say they knew I was coming, but um, uh, they were very, very helpful uh, in all that I did. And without that sort of cooperation, we would not have got what we, what we wanted. I'm just going to show you this, what Duckham was like when I arrived in 2016. Um, 
it was the, the lovely, as you see, the charming fishing boats on the, on the sea there, the magnificent cliffs, the port as it was, still in its embryonic stage. They built the breakwater and the, uh, the dry dock and so on, but everything else um, was uh, still to be developed. The real disappointment was flying over the Crown Plaza uh, Hotel, realising that that actually was the, the, uh, the centre of excellence for looking after me, which was, uh, I wasn't looking forward to going there. As it turned out, of course, the hotel was fine, so please don't feel sorry for me. Um, but that was uh, the Dukham on, on, on arrival. What I would say is that I arrived in October 2016, and by the end of <coughs> August 2017, we had uh, already in a position to sign a memorandum of understanding between Sir Michael Fallon and the Minister responsible for Defence Affairs, His Excellency Saeed El Badr. And that was, and a services agreement with a, uh, the Port of Dukham Company. And that was uh, giving us um, access to the port and to um, um, uh, use of facilities at Dukham in, in general and the establishment of this joint logistics support bank. <coughs> and a quite incredible uh, uh, turnaround, really, in such a sort, short space of time, which just gives you a flavour of the political intent behind this uh, project from both our sides. The uh, Special Economic Zone Authority at Duckham uh, is a, quite an amazing enterprise. It's got 2,000 square kilometres of real estate, twice the size of Singapore, and 90 kilometres of... Um, of coastline. Very split into uh, many different zones, the port obviously, the Oman Dry Dock Company, uh, our support base was going to be located uh, just behind the port in the port area, the Renaissance Village was an accommodation uh, village, which I'll come on to in a moment, the tourist zone uh, split between uh, uh, various hotels and uh, all different kinds of accommodation for tourists, a fishery zone was down here, the airport and down south here was a, um, a, taking a pipeline from the oil refinery, which is really the centrepiece of the whole <coughs> project, uh, down to a strategic oil storage area. And as it turns out, our uh, training area, the joint uh, training area, was located only 60 kilometres south of that, but we didn't know that at the time. So it's an incredible uh, operation, uh, very much in pursuit of um, the uh, prosperity agenda, uh, central to the Omani strategic vision for the economy. And I think um, uh, we all acknowledge right from the start that there was a commercial aspect to the defence hub, albeit a military one. The Omanis were keen to have us as a player in Dukham in order to attract other investors and businesses into the zone to generate income, and that was acknowledged. But because we had that political intent behind us, and it has to be said, some money, the UK received significant advantage by concluding those political and commercial agreements quickly, and we were the first to market, as it were, with in-country investment uh, in that zone. Not only was it a good business deal achieved for the military, but the speed of delivery was highly uh, important to our strategic relationship. There were various uh, components to that uh, zone from our military point of view. Uh, first of all, uh, the port of Duckham headed up by the Porter Duckham Company, and this man, uh, Reggie Vermoulin, uh, Belgian from the point of Antwerp, he's one of these people who go through life being known as just Reggie, and everybody knows who he is. Um, but he was a great driving force with all the uh, Amani MOD players and ministries, making sure that all the administrative and technical details about how the British wanted to operate in the port were met, whether that was uh, dealing with um, uh, vessels coming in for various exercises, the offloading from the roll-on, roll-off ferries, or general port operations, Reggie was the man. And it, this, was a, this aspect, of, obviously, was to support uh, the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy wanted to make sure that the, when they came into Dukham Port, they had all the normal dockyard facilities support, they could have transfer ammunition uh, and so on, and have somewhere for their crews uh, to go. But the good thing is, this is all the civilian enterprise which was adapted by uh, the Omanis and the Port of Dukham Company to suit our military needs. So part of my role was to make sure that any civilian entity understood what we needed as a military to make sure it all worked. The next part of the Dukham Naval Dockyard. This was subject to a, a joint venture uh, between Babcock's and the Oman Dry Dock Company. Uh, with Liam Fox coming out in, uh, in November 2016 to sign that agreement with the Oman Dry Dock Company um, in order to make sure that the expertise in the dry dock 
was able to support a variety of civilian and military activities, whether it's using the, the dry dock, of which there were two, uh, which is Queen Elizabeth uh, class carrier capable, so the Queen Elizabeth carrier can go in there should it be necessary, can also conduct maintenance for warships. So again, that was a key building block to um, building the defence of, to make sure that Royal Navy maintenance requirements were met. And I must say, Babcocks and the Amman Dry Dock Company have gone from strength to strength, doing uh, a huge amount of, uh, of good work to support the Royal Navy. Oops, sorry. The airport, again, is sort of a, a key for us. And although the RAF um, don't have any sort of permanent presence there, they see this uh, as just a, an airfield that they can come and use on a as and when basis. It's a 4,000 uh, metre runway, and the airport, which you can see here, is brand new. And uh, if I had a brand new toy like that, I certainly wouldn't want the Royal Air Force anywhere near it. Um, <laughs> but they were very generous in the way that they understood our requirements to integrate military activity with their normal airport uh, operations. And I think, again, a, a, some really good um, people in the Oman um, Air Management Corporation who were key in understanding what we wanted and making sure it worked. But without that uh, ability to uh, fly an aircraft and uh, keep helicopters based there and so on, we wouldn't have been able to carry out the exercise or prove the point for future uh, operations. The key, I suppose, is the, um, the Joint Logistics Support uh, uh, Base, which, uh, again, His Excellency Mohammed al Razbi played a key role in uh, making sure that we got the permissions we needed to build uh, this uh, particular uh, facility. Um, although uh, Reggie, he gets everywhere, uh, he was, uh, his firm then did the design and build of the uh, facility. Um, initially, we took uh, 33 hectares, um, which uh, is about, I don't know, 80-odd uh, uh, acres of land out of a total of um, 88 hectares, about 200, just over 200 acres, which was offered to us in the Porto Duncan Company area. We decided to phase it in two zones because obviously we wanted to not commit more money than we wanted to do at any one time until we knew quite what the capability could give us. This gives you a flavour of the terrain of which this logistics place was, uh, uh, was uh, located. And CZAD had to level all of that, and the millions and millions of cubic tons of um, uh, rock and sand that they had to move was quite uh, incredible. But in the end, we built uh, two warehouses, which were um, about 4,500 square metres uh, large, uh, and uh, accommodation, offices, guardhouse, and so on and a huge, vast expanse of real estate to use. So that was really that, the, the, the Joint Logistics Support Base. I spoke briefly about the Renaissance Village. This was a workers' camp, which when I arrived was uh, capable of um, uh, uh, housing 16,000 uh, <coughs> workers, and now I believe it's up to something like between 25 and 30,000. <coughs> An amazing facility uh, run by uh, Taos, a brilliant uh, mining company. And uh, we negotiated how the British military could take over one of their blocks for um, safe Syria. So we uh, managed to take, uh, uh, put a thousand men in here or, and women on a block that is actually for two and a half thousand workers. And uh, part of my uh, uh, negotiating skills were tested as you tried to get the price for a thousand as opposed to two and a half thousand. <laughs> um, but they were brilliant in terms of making sure that all our force protection and security arrangements were sorted, and we could not have asked for a better uh, facility in terms of accommodation. The food was unbelievable, and you just didn't get any soldiers out of the cookhouse for many moons. And the, uh, we integrated very well with all the other uh, workers there working in the port. And this was the uh, football pitch here, which there were many different kinds of football matches um, between the nations. So it's an inc incredible um, facility. And without that, we really couldn't have, um, have um, set up the hub. And that's been used subsequently too. So the regional land training hub, I think, is the, um, uh, um, the key that was missing to all this. So you've got the Dukham bit. What um, the Chief of General Staff was very keen to do was to rebalance is training for the future and look to different places to do uh, training, to test our deployability, our, our ability to um, take logistics uh, to where we needed to be for expeditionary and uh, uh, purposes. 
and also train with an in-country uh, troops like Omanis. And also understand what we wanted to do there. We wanted to take four battle groups a year to Oman was the limit of our, ex, uh, of our ambition. And that's quite a big demand in many ways. But that's where, if uh, the Chief of the General Staff was thinking ever of switching from Canada training to, um, to Oman, that's the kind of um, uh, troop levels we'd be looking at. And I took uh, uh, some uh, lovely Omanis, uh, again from, the, from Kossaf and from uh, the Royal Army of Oman to, uh, to Canada to show them a battle group on the ground, what it looked like from our point of view, what the training facilities were like, what the after action review, all those sort of things, just to help put in their minds a picture of what we would like to do. But that was predicated really on finding a new training area. The training areas in Oman at the moment, um, I, I'll just go through very, very quickly. The main one is the Barakat training area, a huge uh, area. Um, in uh, just above um, Babar al Hikman. Um, but no live firing uh, on that particular uh, range. The others of Safar al Doha, Beer, and the Shafa around there as well were all ranges as we would know them. So they're tank ranges or infantry ranges, but not quite enough for us to do uh, live fire and manoeuvre. Ras Bin Tad was an amphibious uh, landing area, and I don't know whether, whether any of you have ever uh, landed there. But uh, again, you know, it didn't have a hinterland where there was a training area. Rubcut in the south near Thumb, Thumb Raid was a very small area, company size only, but again, suffering from encroachment by the civilian expansion as well as the, um, the mining uh, going on. So what you found when I went on a recce to uh, Barakan was all these um, oil and gas um, uh, pipelines. So as we went on uh, th that recce with uh, uh, the Royal Army of Oman, uh, we found that the uh, oil pipelines really narrowed the amount of space that was available for us to manoeuvre. I think um, Ian Buttonshaw, with his Omani compadres, set up Barakat many years ago, I believe, um, with the Omani army. And at that time, uh, they managed to carve out 3,500 square kilometres. By this stage in 2016, it had been reduced to under 2,000 square kilometres, which still sounds a vast, if you're thinking about Salisbury Plain being 350. Um, it sounds vast, it's usable it's training space. But it was clear, really, that an alternative uh, training area needed to uh, be found, both for the Royal Army of Oman, I think, who had um, uh, found that their training was severely limited, but also for the UK, if we'd be able to conduct live fire manoeuvre and make the most of the defence hub uh, at Dugan. So the key to uh, this uh, being un problem being unlocked of a new training was the Ministry of Oil and Gas, and His Excellency Mohammed al Rumi there, uh, who um, very graciously gave his approval to establish a permanent working group to search for a new uh, training uh, area, uh, which was, uh, I think, quite groundbreaking at that time, and the major move forward to uh, solving a major problem. Um, the working group under Saif al-Somani consists of the Royal Army of Oman, myself and senior representatives from um, the Petroleum Development Oman and other oil companies such as Shell, um, CC Energy Development and Lassu. It's very good to see Chris Breeze here who's just entered and uh, I must say that I did have a very useful session uh, with him uh, about where all the um, uh, uh, oil uh, concessions were. What we were mainly concerned with initially was the impact of um, areas uh, block three and four, uh, which covered the Barakat training area. And um, we, uh, sorry, just was my, yeah, so owned by, uh, the concession there was CC Energy Development. And they were continuing to expand their oil um, operations and laying miles upon miles of new pipeline. And uh, since um, the oil and gas exploration has primacy, in the land, it was really squeezing out any other military activity. But you can see that uh, this was going to be a difficult problem uh, to solve. So we examined, this is the working group, all the concession areas. We're trying to identify where there may be some activity which is less than elsewhere. There's the uh, blocks uh, three and four. And we started to look at various other blocks throughout the, uh, um, uh, the country, blocks 54 and 55 became particularly interesting, but other blocks as well came to light. Um, 
I gather there's awful lot of complications with um, exploring for oil, and Chris may want to give a short talk <laughs> after that, after this. But it's, it's not an easy science trying to work out what is below the surface. So some firms come along with a certain amount of equipment, I gather. Uh, their readings are, are difficult to interpret, and they then make a decision or not as to whether they're going to uh, exploit it. And I think it's what um, certain areas in Oman certainly found, is that some companies would go in, have a look, come away saying there's nothing there, and some years later, another company would go back in and have another go and something may be found if they get uh, better readings or better, more advanced equipment. So it was actually, I think, an imprecise science, but then others will, will say there's no such thing. So um, we needed to find a new train area that was suitable, and um, we needed a, a terrain which was... Um, uh, very complex in a way and very challenging and we needed 4,000 uh, square uh, kilometres. We needed to assess all the oil and gas exploration, the encroachment of oil pipelines and the oil company's future plans, but also the impact on the, uh, the Bedouin and their livestock and the environment. And also, if Duckham is the hub from where all our logistics uh, will come through, how far can we go from Duckham? Is that 400 kilometres? Maximum, I would suggest. So that also limited where we could uh, where we could go. So um, the key was at the Ministry of Oil and Gas Working Group in August 2017. The Port of Duckham Authority, sorry, Port, the Petroleum Duckham, the Pe Petroleum <laughs> Development Oman identified five areas from the satellites uh, imagery of the absence of the oil and gas infrastructure. Now, this will shock you, but they came up with Bar el Hikman, which obviously is a Ramsar site. Uh, and no wonder there's no oil and gas there. It's at the bottom of the Wahiba Sands and a conservation area. So we ruled that one out. You'll be pleased to hear fairly quickly. As we did down in the desert, um, just to the west of the Salala Thumbrate Road, um, where we were, didn't want to have um, uh, any training uh, near uh, Yemen, of course. So we ruled uh, that, uh, that out pretty quickly, which left us what I'd call the, the Hukuf, it was quite a wide expanse, as you know, and uh, an area around Ras Madraka and Jilat Arkan, um, just um, bomb from the Jilat al Harasses. So to examine these uh, areas, we went uh, on a pretty rapid recce just to go and see what was going on. And this is what we found, of course, in uh, the vicinity of the Oryx uh, Sanctuary. It had been a vast area, um, some 30... Um, uh, some 34,000 uh, square kilometres, but reduced to about 3,000 in later years. But again, huge amounts of fences, oryx um, over the area, and as well as the hook of depression, which made that pretty uh, inhospitable for, uh, uh, and unfeasible for manoeuvre training for the military. Also, there was uh, the Jidat uh, Arkad. I so think if you go down the road from uh, Dukham down to Salala, there's a massive escarpment on your right-hand side, some distance inland. But you can see it here. And there's, for miles and miles and miles, there's absolutely no way up it. And um, uh, it's a very uh, stark uh, uh, escarpment. And then when you get to the top, it's a very, very flat plateau. So again, uh, although it was a, uh, an area that was free from oil and gas exploration, you couldn't get up there very easily, and once you were there, there was nothing but a, a flat uh, plain. Which rather, sort of uh, neatly, uh, brought us to Ras Madraka, which um, was a completely different <coughs> kettle of fish right by the coast, which allowed us to consider amphibious training as well, and uh, a very much more complex terrain, um, with uh, some, some quite amazing series of of wadi complexes, some uh, close to some deep ravines, um, some complex uh, uh, obstacle crossing uh, areas, but also some flat desert plain as well. So it gave us uh, really uh, a bit of uh, a bit of everything, and there were four thousand square kilometres that seemed to be available. So you can just see here some of the, the varied terrain, and we got very excited when we found this because we used to, you come really from a flat desert plain and suddenly there are some quite reasonable undulations and good uh, complex uh, terrain. And we found also, we went back to, to look at this area and probably, that Petrogas, who had got that uh, area, had given that concession area back to the government, so it was free of an energy uh, company, which again made it uh, really good. And this is Wadi Durf, which um, you, you will, if you've ever travelled down to Three Palms Lagoon, I don't know if you've travelled down to Three Palms Lagoon, what will shock you is that um, the, if you now go to Three Palms Lagoon, at the end of that you'll find a Challenger 2 tank at the end of Wadi Durf. 
Um, so this um, wadi uh, arrives at that particular location. And I thought I'd just let you uh, 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 feast on this picture for a little while to cast you back to your happy times uh, in Oman. And uh, if, you, if I, I can start talking again in about 20 minutes or so. <laughs> But that was the end of the awarding. But I think uh, it was a, uh, an amazing area. And for us, it was close to Dukum. And that was the main thing. We needed to be close to Dukum. Although we had this great idea that we can deploy from the port 200, 300, 400 kilometres, getting somewhere that's in 60 to 100 kilometres is much more sensible. There was a good road network. Um, there was much less activity south of uh, Dukum compared to all the construction traffic to the north. So it became a very ideal area and a lovely beach at the end of it. Um, we then conducted various uh, recce with the Royal Army of Oman, uh, particularly uh, Major, um, with probably uh, now uh, a, a Colonel, Abdul Hakim Al Hosni, who was one of my students uh, in the Qatar Staff College. And we happened by fate to be working absolutely cheek by jowl and finding a new training area together uh, in the Oman. Um, they were brilliant. We went out uh, and uh, travelled all over the area, which was a, a great experience to be uh, with them. And uh, uh, the great uh, aspect was I couldn't go anywhere without the protection of a submachine gun. <laughs> uh, dealing with the Army of Oman was the, uh, it was the lovely and interesting and easy bit. And then you have to deal with the British Army, which uh, then takes a lot more convincing. However, part of the, uh, the role, I felt, was to make sure that we put the uh, Brigadier of Army training, uh, Bobby, Bobby Walton and I, in front of the right people, particularly Air Commodore um, uh, Maktoum al Mizrahi, who's another key driving force in this, and sell the idea of this, because I think there was a lot of um, questions about, do we want to go and train in Oman? Is it not the right sort of terrain? What's the logistic tail going to look like? And anybody who came first to Oman, to Dukham, and then to see this um, area was mightily impressed. And uh, you understand now how the whole defence hub started to work together with inload of equipment and access to a training area, as well as training with another uh, armed forces. Say Surreal, which was the, I won't dwell on it too much, it was the biggest exercise uh, for us in 15 years in 2018, and acted as a really uh, excellent catalyst to get the Dukum defence hub uh, established. This is the handover ceremony uh, with Mark Langster, who's the Minister of Armed Forces, with uh, Brigadier Salman al Salmi, who is the um, um, uh, Office Director for um, the Secretary General, who's his, uh, his staff officer. And this just shows you some of the inload of equipment uh, into the uh, into logistics support base during Safe Surya. And it proved its worth and it allowed us to test so many aspects of the, uh, uh, of the defence hub. With tanks coming off, uh, air, you know, Apache helicopters, naval ships all lined up for Caesarea. I mean, it was an incredible uh, uh, waypoint, really, in establishing uh, that defence hub. And no sooner had we done Caesarea, to we moved on to signing a joint defence agreement um, just after that with, um, again, with um, Saeed Al-Bala and uh, Gavin Williamson, who I think has had a couple of jobs since then. <laughs> and this um, deepens um, defence co cooperation, establishes a new joint military training area, the Oman-British Joint Training Area, and shows that the UK is committed to the development of Dukham Port following the opening of the joint support base. But you can see how many agreements and uh, at political level were signed in a very, very short space of time. But we wanted to keep up the momentum um, following the um, uh, exercise states through to maximise the benefits um, that we had uh, already established through that exercise. And this is called Exercise Kanjar uh, Oman, held on Ras Madraka training area to trial the concept from our point of view of an expeditionary or steer training on a new and unproved training area and test fully all components of defence up. A company of the Desert Regiment and a squadron of tanks um, from the Imani side, and the UK provided 400 troops, a company of infantry, and a troop of Challenger 2, and conducted uh, uh, joint uh, training missions. And indeed, the first uh, tank to fire on that range, on that training area, was a Imani Challenger 2. Uh, and that really, really sealed it for me at the end of my tenure in Oman, is not only have we set up the defence, we proved it through a very large scale exercise. And we'd gone to train uh, uh, jointly with the Omani Army on a new, brand new training area where we combined, uh, we conducted combined missions of live fire manoeuvre. And I think uh, that was something that I left Oman feeling very, very uh, happy about. 
And there's just a few more shots of, uh, of uh, that exercise. And Waddy Durf again. And there are, there are three palms again at the end of that. So what are the future plans? Well, what's um, uh, been happening since I left is that Ben Wallace, the Secretary of State for Defence, is very keen to do war in Oman. He fully endorses the United Kingdom presence in Dukham. He's visited twice and has uh, pledged uh, another £24 million investment in the hub for, to uh, better facilitate British Army training and improve the infrastructure on Ras Madraka, with the aim of providing the Army with two four-month rotations there. So that's a really um, incredible uh, development. We also use Dokken and the airport and the logistics base for the drawdown of, of equipment from uh, Afghanistan, having a, uh, a, a nucleus of 170 personnel based in Dokken. The um, HMS Montrose has undergone two uh, maintenance periods there. It's now a permanent ship in the Gulf, and they change over their crews every several months using Dokken as a base to do that. The aircraft carrier and the carrier strike group on its way back from Japan will call in at uh, Dukham. Uh, and uh, we've got to have, uh, we're going to get the extra five, 55 uh, hectares on the logistic support base. So it's back to a lot more levelling and digging. But that is a major move. So at the end of that, we'll have 88 hectares, over 200 acres in, uh, in Dukham. So by invigorating the relationship with the Sultan of Oman, the UK forces now find themselves able to operate in a country of geopolitical importance with thousands of square miles of challenging terrain as well as a strategic facility to support activity, not only east of Suez, but east of Dukham. For those who doubt or are sceptical of the Britain's role and place in the world, you only have to look at the recent enhanced commitment to Oman, and Dukham in particular, to see that the UK is still determined to invest abroad in support of its international obligations and the security of a key ally. Both countries still place huge value on our unique relationship. The Dukham project is a manifestation of our renewed commitment to the region and gives uh, substance to a more global mindset. Jan Morris, a renowned travel writer and former Ninth Lancer, had the rare privilege of accompanying Sultan Taimur on a generally stately but intrepid progress in 1955 throughout the entire country. At that time, he saw a decline in British ambition in the Gulf and wrote, For there was creeping over our British policies a certain niggling timidity and mediocrity. A cramped, middle-of-the-road caution, badly out of tune with a symphony of power and vaulting ambition being played by our competitors. This was written, of course, before the decision in 1968 to withdraw British forces east of Suez. But in today's febrile world, there's still no shortage of malign uh, competitors who would threaten all of our security and prosperity. The Dukham Defence Hub in Oman shows that the UK views a permanent military presence in the Gulf as a cornerstone of its foreign policy and is returning east of Suez. Thank you very much. agreement between Qatar and Turkey mm. about Qatari use of an air base in Turkey was published. And essentially, if you were a, a, a Qatari airplane, you had to have a Turkish pilot sitting in it. If, if there was a, a vehicle leaving the base, you had to have a Turkish soldier sitting in it. Basically, the, the, what you could do without any uh, immediate uh, oversight by the, the host nation yeah. was, was very yeah. stark. Could you give some indication as to what degree of oversight um, it is proposed um, or, or it is set up and implicit in the arrangement. So, yeah. for example, when the base was used in the withdrawal yeah. from Afghanistan, yeah. did you have to, you know, did, were there a, a whole series of permissions which had to be yeah. acquired before the, yeah. the base was used? Yeah, I, I'm, I think the key thing to say is that at every level there are, uh, there's a permissive environment. So if the, um, if the answer is yes, what's the question, is normally the way I think that uh, we, we, on my experience of dealing with Oman is uh, in, in respect of Dukham. Um, but the key is um, uh, interagency coordination and negotiation. 
So um, part of our um, effort for Safe Syria and anything else was dealing with the Royal Amman Police. Funny enough, and they have a base, a big base um, uh, in, uh, in Dukham. And um, uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that they understood who we are, what we're doing, what our plans were. They understood where they had to provide uh, convoy escorts or uh, guards for us. But the coordination was very much uh, from the military level. Uh, we always had a liaison officer with us. So there's always a, uh, we're never alone. Uh, not that we were going to go rogue, but we felt that there was nobody was checking up on us. It was actually making sure that things were smoothed. But that took a lot of prior coordination. But the, but the door was open. Not sure that answers your question, but we had a um, you know, uh, tremendous uh, cooperation. So. Was yours a one-off appointment in a transition stage? Or do you ha did you have a successor yeah. who is the continuing president? Yeah. So I've, I've, I handed over to uh, another full colonel uh, who's um, been there well, two years now. And um, that last slide of the information about what's been happening um, uh, is really from uh, my conversations with him. But he's seeing a, a build-up as well. And I think this is uh, going to be a very much enduring uh, construct and uh, even talking about having... Uh, more permanent staff based down there to facilitate training and build up that training area and to look after the logistics aspects of the port. So I think this will only get bigger and it needs a, uh, does need an officer who can work the embassy and MOD, UK MOD lines as well as the Omani lines at the sort of more strategic level in country. Thank you. David, I presume it's not exclusive British Oman. I mean, Oman, are the other people using the base and the training area, obviously, probably. I mean, particularly, yeah. say, Americans, are they coming into Dukum yeah. and then doing some things? I mean, is it in the agreement to sort of... Um, the, um, so the, 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 the zone where the uh, military uh, logistics support base is is called the Military Logistics Centre, uh, and that is about 278 hectares in total. And the Amaras were offering this to anybody who would like to uh, use it from a friendly nation perspective. Uh, the British were there first, expecting uh, the Americans uh, that would be fast on our heels. And that's what you told me, Brigadier uh, Ahmed. That's why we rush uh, uh, so quickly. And, uh, and the Americans are still yet to sign uh, anything. So they're taking their time. And I think one of the major problems was single source um, procurement. We very quickly acknowledged and got agreement that the Port of Dukham Company, or IMDAD, the new uh, Marnie company, was our single source. And uh, there was no other players in the pitch. We had to go through them, and there have been benefits from that. And the most uh, incredible aspect of our whole uh, civil service uh, aspect was they acknowledged that that was the only way that could be done. The Americans, by contrast, are having significant problems with that. Uh, the Indians may or may not take up some space there. Uh, for logistics, but basically logistics storage. As far as the training area goes, we were very clear from the start, as were the Omanis, that this was an, a, a joint Omani-British training area. Not that it would be exclusive to us, but if the Americans came along and wanted to get their Marines off and do a beach landing and go and do some live firing, <coughs> neither party is going to say, no, you're going to try and integrate that, but that's a very much an Omani decision. Yes. But I think on the British side, um, from a investment point of view, what we wanted to make sure that if we were going to come and use Dukham and the training area, we had guaranteed access. Because if the future is, and it's not necessarily uh, going to happen, but say that Canada does uh, our training area there, falls, and we commit somewhere else, we want to make sure that we've got the, um, the usage there uh, that justifies that investment. And I think the mind is absolutely clear with that. Sure. David, thanks for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Have we yet set up a sort of room on of uh, battalions or battle groups going out to train yeah. as we have had in Battersea in yeah. Canada? Yeah. And, and when they get there, if yeah. there is, do they automatically train with Oman forces? Yes. Yeah. So um, the. I think the original plan for this year was to put a, put a company um, out into Ras Madraka. Actually, they're gonna, they've upped that to a battle group of uh, the 1st Battalion Royal Irish Regiment, and they will deploy with a company, I think, is the, um, the SAF Recce Regiment. So uh, an absolute fundamental principle is that we, 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 we've, we don't want to train on our own. 
And I think the criticism of Canada is that we trained on our own in almost too pure a training environment is that the uh, observer controllers could tick on any number of boxes, but it, but it left aside a lot of the realities and frictions of training at reach with a, another army. And I think we, we will, every time we go, we will want to train with the Amanis, um, uh, if that's possible. Yes, too fascinating. Thank you. Um, my background is RAF Regiment Salala years and years ago, and then Jebel Regiment as a company commander, and latterly Rolls Royce supplying aero engines to Oman. Yeah. And I've been a visitor for many, many years. Terrific to see all this. My concern is how vulnerable is Dukum? Is it now a target for terrorists? Is it a target for indirect attack? And what do we do about that? Yeah. And who does it? Yeah. It's a very good question. And I think that um, uh, we, although we call the, um, the base itself, of the Joint Logistics Support Base, the, the entirety is a defence hub. And it's not meant to be putting into anybody's mind that this is a British base. Therefore, we are not responsible for the security of that particular uh, area, less our own um, uh, particular logistics um, uh, support base. The wider security is very much an Omani um, issue, and we, uh, I think, it'd be fair to say that we don't get involved in that. Um, in, I think in the way that you're you're intimating, because I think we are in a host nation who is responsible for that security. It, is, it could be, well be vulnerable, but I think if you go down there, uh, you, you can't creep into Dukum um, un, un, unannounced. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, police and a lot of military there. Um, and I think, of one people, I think there's a, a, a zone there called the safe and secure area. Amen, where Amman, I think, is, uh, is that right? Or something like that, a zone <laughs> where all the police and the military uh, operate from. Um, I think everywhere is vulnerable, and I think we have our own force protection measures when we're in there, um, and we had a lot of um, uh, uh, security staff coming out before Safe Syria to check the accommodation, the port air and everything, to satisfy our own requirements. But um, the Omanis have got that well in hand, I would suggest. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you agree it was a fascinating uh, lecture. We've yeah. heard it from the horse's mouth, um, full of fact, and it will give us a lot to think about. Uh, in the coming months. David, thank you very much for that, David. It's excellent. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank David and his team for making this happen. And I'd like to thank you all too for coming, otherwise it wouldn't be worth holding at all. So thank you very much indeed. Thank and just one last <laughs> This is a potential venue for the next uh, anglo Mining Society uh, <laughs> and the general meeting and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Safo Association meeting. It stands in the park in Sussex. All welcome. <laughs> well, it's pretty exciting. <laughs>